Hi and welcome to Dr. Mix Beatles special. You know that I have been going around Abbey Road Studios. Look, look, I still have my bracelet thingy. I have somebody on the phone who literally writes the books about this. <laughs> Coming up. <laughs> How you guys doing? Are you okay? Great to see you. Listen, I am a big fan of UK music scene. You have to understand that the Beatles not only were amazing artists, but they also created the core of the industry. England is known for exporting music, very famously. And I've always been into the sound of Beatles. It was a little bit before my generation, but you know, as a professional producer, if you don't know the Beatles, man. So, I have got in touch with Jerry Hammack, who writes books about how the Beatles recorded everything. I mean, literally. Schemes, songs, microphone, everything. Jerry, welcome to the channel. Thank you, good doctor. It's great to see you today. <laughs> It's great to see you too. Firstly, where are you calling us from? Tell them. I'm in beautiful downtown Toronto, uh, Ontario, Canada my home. That's great. So for the people who don't know who you are, why don't you give us like the one minute and a half <laughs> version of, uh, <laughs> of your biography? A uh, lifelong musician and worked in, uh, in music semi-professionally and professionally for years and years and years. Been doing mixing and production and recording as an artist for 30 something years now, focusing now on mixing. Always been interested in how music was created how recordings were created. Since I was a child, I was diagramming recordings. At one point, about a decade ago, I had a little time on my hands. And since the Beatles would always come up when I was producing, can you get me McCartney's bass sound? Can you get me that Leslie guitar grunge that Harrison used on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds? Since right. those things would come up, I was like, eh, I got a little time. Let's start looking into this. And down the rabbit hole I went right. to try to figure it all out every single song, every single session, everything that they committed to tape. Wow. And uh, here I am. It's a, I think I'm in the 12th year of this volume four of a five book series is going out at Christmas. So it's what uh, versions do I have here? I've got one and two. Yeah, you've got one and two. We'll get you three. So one covers 1961 through 64, their earliest recordings up through Beatles for Sale. Second volume covers uh, Help Through Revolver. The third volume, and these are all out right now, the third volume covers uh, Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour. <laughs> yeah. Pepper. And then uh, volume four, which will be out for Christmas uh, this year, will cover 1968. So that's primarily the White Album, but right. uh, also the Yellow Submarine release, soundtrack release. So I'm looking at, you know, just any here, all right? Um, twist and shout. So here you got the session was in February 11th, 1963 and February 25th, 1963. Okay, it's a 1958 Rickenbacker 325 Capri electric guitar. Man, you go in depth here. Okay, the first question, how do you acquire? I mean, you have like schemes for microphone placement. How do you begin acquiring all this information? There's been a few sort of foundational books that were done. One of them in 1988 was Mark Lewison's Beatles Recording Sessions. So that's one of the foundational works of this kind of study. Andy uh, Babbock did a Beatles gear book that added some more information to the mix. Ryan and Kihu did a book called Recording the Beatles, which was a really in-depth look at the equipment of Abbey Road. So they went in great depth to break down like the channel cassettes for a Red 51 console right. or a TG12345 console. Uh, frequency response of the equalization units that were built into the cassettes, all this sort of stuff, right. really in-depth. What had never been done though, and what, what I did was to take some of that information and then fill in the blanks where there were blanks had been left because those three authors in particular had their own kind of narrative scheme. Right. But no one had taken both that information as well as filled in the gaps where it was incomplete in relation to that information and tied it back to the actual work that was done. Right. You know, Mark Lewison's book, again, fantastic book 
gives you an outline of the sessions, but sometimes you would follow a different narrative of a particular day in the studio because that was more interesting. Like it's way more interesting to know that the session in 67 for Pepper was the one where Lennon came in stoned on acid and Martin sent him up on the roof and they were afraid he might have jumped. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that's way more interesting than they attempted to track the vocal for being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. Did you actually manage to get in touch with Abbey Road? Did you get any special access or is that literally I impossible? Get, I didn't get special access. I asked for special access and I continue to ask for special access. To some degree, these books are, are alive. As new information comes in, and like with these anniversary editions, mercifully, the anniversary editions of the Beatles releases that have been coming out, right. there's some new information that, that percolates out of that. Now, mercifully, for me, I'm lagging a little bit on my publishing schedule compared to the 50, these 50th anniversary schedules. Right. So I was able, for instance, with the Pepper book, uh, my Pepper book, to look at what Kevin Howlett had done for the anniversary edition and balance it against all the research that I had been doing over a decade right. to see what made sense. And some of it helped and some of it I knew was not quite on. Right. But I'm not on the pinched deadlines that Kevin Howlett was right. on. Right, right, so right. Got it. I, I appreciate all that. All right. So let's get to the nitty gritty of it now. I'm okay. very excited. Let's do it. So let's do it. can you please outline the typical vocal chain to record okay. Paul McCartney. So typical up until 1969, when they introduced the TG12345 solid state console in Studio 2, they would have been using one of the two versions of the red console that they had at EMI Studios, which so is what those Abbey preamps. Was. Yeah, they're, they're the, they had red preamps in them. So it was a tube based preamp that was built into the board. In fact, the board had like, I want to say it's a red 47 was the preamp. This is coming off the top of my head. So Beatles geeks out there, cut me a little bit of slack here <laughs> <laughs> you, you um, know that you're gonna get a lot of comments for anything oh yeah yeah yeah, say, yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 oh yeah, i get picked apart left and right it's okay <laughs> comes with the turf yeah the they were using one of the valve based tube based red consoles either red 37 or red 51 depending on what studio they're working in the front end of this was going to be a u48 microphone u48 or, um, you said uh, yeah neumann, Which one is a neumann it? So a, a 48 has a switchable polar pattern that is cardioid and figure of eight, whereas the 47 had cardioid and omni, I believe was the switchable uh, pattern. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Was uh, this a fat version or tube version? Tube version. Right. Yeah, these are old, you know, even, in the, even when they were using them, these are microphones that were, you know, a number of years old. Um, uh, EMI had determined that their U47s in general weren't that useful for them for a lot of the recording that they were doing beyond orchestral recording. And they had some of the U47s modified by uh, Neumann to a U48. So those ones carried a designation of a U47 U48 or U47 slash right. 8. But in essence, all of them were you know, U48s. But it would have been so used <clears throat> in uh, cardioid mode. Yeah, you, well, they used them in figure of eight mode when they were doing harmonies, too. Ah. They would say, and interesting point with that was before, oh, Revolver, they were still using four monitors to monitor the performance they had done when they were overdubbing. Right. They would set the vocal microphone up and the monitor would be at the point of rejection and then they would sing on either side of it. And so they could hear without headphones they could hear the backing track and sing to it wow. and sing simultaneously to it. You know, they did that for the first five years of their recording. And at this point, they were recording on what? Straight to disc or presumably four track? They were recording four track at this time. They were using either the Telefunken um, M10 or they were using the Studer J37 four yeah. track. Yeah, I've actually touched the J47 that they have there. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. man, you know, getting into that room. Oh my God, that was incredible. And um, yeah. so there would be no compression. Like I know there, that they're there, famous for the Altec lensings and uh, and the Fairchild, yeah, there, now, obviously. Yeah, no, there there was compression. They commonly used the Fairchild, the 660, on the back end for vocals. But so going so, into tape, going to tape. Yeah. So so what would happen because they were limited with gear? So think about this. A session involving the Beatles would have an early session, what we're talking about now. So let's say pre-67. Right. They're going to have a console. They're going to have a four track. 
They're going to have maybe two of the Alltech 456 compressors that were modified and became EMI uh, RS 125s. Yep. So modified the EMI spec. They would have maybe two of those. And then they would have one or two of the Fairchild limiters. Because they were so limited with gear, they didn't use the gear as inserts, although the console, the red consoles would facilitate that. They didn't use them that way. They used them on the output. Right. So signal comes into the red console, equalization, level balancing, out to hit the limiter, limiter to tape. Wow. So <laughs> tube microphone, tube yep. pre, uh, uh, yep. obviously EQ was tube, and then it would go into the Altec, and then it would yep. hit the tape. Yep. So that, that's a really good way to slow the sound down, isn't it? Yeah, well, and if you kind of forensically listen to that or, or with a forensic mind, you can hear that thickening. You can hear, yeah. you know, you can hear the impact of the compression right. that's going on with it. It's part of the character of that sound is that yeah. it, uh, it is that overall compression. Yeah. Um, in the earliest recordings that they were doing, which were twin track or twin track stereo, right. now think that the fact that we've got multiple guitars that are going out through you know, one or two outs and they're hitting it. Right. So all of this stuff in the uh, current terminology, you'd think of is that they're summing things down and then they're hitting right. their compression. So lots of what we might call mix bus compression right. nowadays, right? What's right. going on? So w would there be any difference in, in general between the way they would mic John or anyone else? So early on when Norman Smith was the lead engineer, and the band was using similar Vox cabinets. They were using the uh, AC30 cabinets. Right. In order to give some sort of differentiation between the tone, because also remember the release format is mono here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And this was up until uh, when when did they release the first stereo record? Releasing stereo all along in the in the States, they were making stereo versions, but it wasn't what they were recording yeah, yeah, for. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. The so they were recording for mono. So I, all of this was just towards that. Their goal was toward mono. And so uh, Smith early on would use a uh, U47, U48 on one of the guitar cabinets and a uh, Neumann KM56 on another cabinet. When late, as they moved into their career and they started getting more amps to play with, right. and the amps started differentiating, that became less and less of an issue. Then it was much more common that there would be a couple of, of uh, U48s that were on the cabinets. Wow. So you've gone straight to uh, guitars at this point. <laughs> so since you did that, I'm going to say before we hit the drums, because I know yeah. we're going to have to spend some time around those, let's just speak bass. How yeah. would they in general record their basses? Would this be direct? Would it be through an amp? Early on, they were mic'd. They were using an uh, STC4038 was the microphone uh, that of ribbon? choice. Yeah, ribbon. And later on, they would be using a uh, AKG D12 was kind That's of my choice. That's for kick drum. What are you talking about? <laughs> hey. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting with the D12s, right? The you know the frequency response of a D12 is not quite good enough to capture, but it does enough to capture. Right. And uh, apparently, that was the case back in the day too. So that was what was used early on to mic a cabinet. Right. As we move into the Pepper era, now DI came into the mix and Jeff Emmerich would mix a DI signal with a couple of mics on McCartney's cabinet. He would use an AKG C12. Okay. And then he would continue to use either a, a D12 or an STC as an ambient mic. Right. About eight feet or so off of the cabinet to get some body and room and depth to it. So up to three uh, uh, signals that were comprising the bass sound right. in the Pepper era and beyond. Have you noticed that so far you've been mentioning pretty much large diaphragm and ribbon? Did they yeah. use any small diaphragm at all? Yeah, they used the D19C was like a workhorse microphone there. So and that's just very affordable back in the day for them. That got used for drum overheads. Right. In the drum kit, when the drum kit went beyond two mics, which initially was, but when it went beyond two mics, that was the common microphone that was used all over the kit. It was used for pianos. Right. At times. Right. The Chowan uh, tack piano, studio piano yeah. style would use that microphone. 
the D19C. What I find interesting about uh, small diaphragm is that they usually sound more in focus than larger diaphragm. It's easier to get a fast attack out of them. Yeah. I like to use it on acoustic guitars, classic guitars, and of course, strings, cello, whilst on the piano, I I tend to prefer larger diaphragm microphones. What are your thoughts about it? You know, there's an immediacy to like dynamic microphones on, especially like amplifiers and things like that. It's hard to beat. And as you point out, the focus of sound, the mid ranginess that is inherent in them is a very positive thing. The other is, I think, and why the Beatles use them too, is it's expedient. It gets the job done and it gets the job done to an acceptable level. Yeah. And a lot of what I learned about the Beatles' work in the studio was, in the background, this was a studio that was just running sessions to create records to release. Right. And I like always have in my... Yeah, it's like, yeah a, a bit like a factory. And when you have processes down, so for your audience to keep in mind, this is pre the spoiled days of Pepper and Beyond. Right. Okay? You know, to keep that factory moving, you have known processes that always work for you right and so you repeat those processes so i know that you know i i know this mic sounds good on a guitar amp i'm not going to mess around going i wonder what mic i'll use on an amp today Done. no Done. the d9tc does the job or the u48 does the trick put it eight inches off of the cabinet you know angle it here job done and we start recording we get a song done in the session that's the that's the goal I'm very passionate about being practitioners. One thing that uh, most people don't understand is that it takes a level of, you know, repeating things over and over and over and over again. I mean, I was lucky that I started like as a teenager in the studio. So some yeah. processes to me are like, you know, reading or riding the bike because I used to work in a studio that had like tons and tons of production. So it was a little bit like a factory. And because you keep on doing that, you know, it's like you're going to the gym, right? The first time you lift 10 kilos, you know, after three years, you lift 100 kilos, right? It's the yeah, yeah, same yeah. thing. And before I throw the next question, I'm going to make you a little bit jealous because ah. I did have special access to the Abbey Road microphone room. Oh, so, yeah, I know, I know. So oh what, uh, what was like really spectacular. So they keep the small ones. They have like very large drawers, like, yeah. you know, basically they lay one next to the other. So you have yeah. one drawer for the 414 one drawer for you know whatever you know it's a, every drawer has like like 10 you know and then there is like in the middle because this room is like a corridor and in the middle yep. they have like the really heavy stuff like the right. 47s the 48s uh, 67s uh, and sevens, yeah. uh, they pull it out from the case and you can see these things and they know the you know serial numbers by heart you know because right. I mean, for right. example they have a decatry he yep. was showing me, okay, this is the one that we would put last on the decatry in this position and not this serial number, this serial number, because I've tried this one, but this works better. So they know their microphones, not only down to their models, but down to what each sounds how. And they yep. have like this big book handwritten, which must be, I don't know, speak about priceless objects. This is yeah. the book where they keep track of every single thing that they've done to each microphone. You know, if wow. they have replaced yeah. a part yeah. uh, and ways to use it. Yeah. I mean, this book is like, you know, mostly yellowed. It's been there for so many years. They keep on using it. Man, the level of care, the level of heritage that was in that room and the, those processes. And it wasn't like fancy. There was nothing fancy about it. It was just practical. I was blown away by it. It's such a fantastic point that just came through loud and clear to me again in doing this research that this was all about being practical. We were able to look at the Beatles' career at EMI in its totality. We were able to look at it from the end of it back to the beginning of it, right? We'll layer meaning onto that ability to view the career in that way. But in the heart of it, just like you do every day with your work in your studio, you're getting a job done to serve a client to get product into the market. You figure out your processes that do that really, really well. And every once in a while, you get thrown a curve. And when that curve comes, as it did for the engineers at EMI, now your creativity comes into play. 
So now you have someone like Ken Townsend who comes up with uh, artificial double tracking or comes up with a way to sync two four track machines because they ran out of tape for a day in the life. They ran out of room on the tape to print the orchestras. There was a problem that needed to be solved. And so now the creativity comes in. But if we're talking about a routine pop song, they're cranking them out yeah. left and right, day in, day out, yep. to a really high standard. There is a, there is a very big advantage of working like that, which is freshness. You know, the, uh, Quincy Jones talks often about analysis paralysis, which yeah. is very true. You know, it's like there is the, the moment of creation is usually a certain amount. Everything else is, you know, I've already performed. Now whatever action I'm going to take is going to be less interesting than what just happened in the room, which I have documented with microphones. So you can only end up, you know, messing it. And yeah, speed. We're so privileged. I know you are aware of that. You know, it's like not only are we born in the lucky part of the world and be healthy, and but, you know, we got music. So we're so privileged in this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, because, you know, we get to work every day with music. And so I think that at this point, the time is mature to throw in the big question. All right, let's talk about Ringo's drums. Oh, okay. All right. All okay. right. You can All right, we have to. <sighs> Deep breath. <laughs> Deep breath. It's star time. All right. Okay, so uh, let, let's go in this order. Drum kit, positioning, microphones. Okay. Kits were, kits were Ludwig kits. The Black Oyster Pearl uh, was the, I think... Oh, the, the exact name of the super classic something kit. It's, it's totally escaping me, and I apologize, Beatle fans. His core kit, it's right there in the book <laughs> that you've got a copy of and I don't. Yeah. Ludwig was his drum of choice. His snare of choice remained the same for almost every kit after he got this jazz festival snare. And an initial measure one, I think it was a 14 by four and a half. And normally, I believe they're 14 by five is the standard measure. But was it metal or, or wood? Uh, wood. And he used that snare with every kit. So he used the same snare across his career. Even when he went to the Hollywood uh, Maple kit, starting in late 68, but 69 with Let It Be and then with Abbey Road, he went to uh, a clear maple. Would he use any means of stopping the sound like a tea towel? Oh, yeah. He started with cigarette boxes, but tea towels became the dampener of choice that they would use. They would also use uh, guitar cleaning cloths, but... Most associated with Ringo and his dampening is going to be tea towels right. draped over the drums. That really impacted the sound starting with Pepper. Those really wonderful yet short, deep tom-tom yeah. sounds are coming from the use of that. Also, a miking technique. And Rick started miking underneath the drums in that period, too. To oh, capture. okay. So, so now, all of a sudden, we have bottom for the snare. Yeah, well, right. top and bottom on the snare, but miking the toms a number of times. The toms would get miked underneath. Right. How about how about the toms? Would they be open in the bottom, or would it be open? Uh, open. open. Yeah. Right. And as I mentioned earlier, lots of AKG D19Cs were being used around the kit. Right. Uh, for the over sorry, say that again, please. A lot of the AKG D19C microphones were being used all around the kit. Can you please remind me what kind of microphones they are? Because I am I'm blanking. It's a out. dynamic. It's a dynamic, Just a dynamic affordable. Close miking. Close miking. That was another big difference with when Emmerich took over. Norman Smith, as their earliest recording engineer, used only two microphones. He would use a D19 basically above Ringo's head at the center of the kit, pointing down, and then a, 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 a an S. TC 4038 or an AKG uh, D12 in front of the kick drum. Its placement was, if you can picture this uh, facing the drum head, its placement was at about one o'clock just below the rim and maybe eight inches out. Right. So that helped a little bit. And then the low then end angled. would form because you pull it back, right? Yeah. Getting, what, you know, what is getting sound out of a microphone? It's all about how much air you take in, yeah. how that air is getting pushed and yeah. moved, how much air you allow to be pushed to the point of reception. Right. And it gave a little air. And that also gave opportunity for the tom to be picked Pick up. up. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, I forgot to ask you. So the, the kick would be how big? 22 inch. 22 inch. All right. Yeah. And standard uh, depth. Standard depth. Right. And they would use uh, like two heads, front and back? For a while, 
it was the show kit, but uh, they started re- removing the front head and they had a sweater that he would put in for dampening in the bottom of the kick, you know, once again, to reduce some of the ring. So eventually an open front that, that was probably in the 67, 68 period where that was an option that was being employed right. uh, before that dual head. So and from no, from, no from Pepper on, uh, you were saying that, so basically now we would have top and bottom for the snare, and those would yep. be 19s again? There's going to be an, uh, a 19 underneath. They used a KM56 uh, on top of the snare at that era, a uh, Neumann KM56. Is that the small diaphragm? Yeah. Cool, got it. And then for overheads, they would use? Overhead was a single AKG D19C, just like basically above Ringo's head, just in front. And for the kick, uh, you said the D12? Uh, D12. Yeah, D12 was very common. As they got into the Let It Be era, they started using a couple of mics on the kick, and that would be it was a D12 and a Sony C30, I believe. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, I think it's C30. Oh, that's a, that's a condenser microphone, isn't it? Yes. So, but it, it can withstand the power of a kick drum. Apparently. apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so um there was a general ban on using ribbons like the the stc uh microphone for low frequency applications but the beatles were able to continue that longer than anybody else because they were the beatles and that's true of a lot of gear in the studio they got their hands on um a mastering compressor the rs56 right that no one got the curve bender people might know it as. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and And no one got, you know, the curve bender was part of the mastering work, the, the disc cutting work that was done. Well, the Beatles got to record with it. You know, they, they got that EQ on the front end when they decided, you know, the, when the time came and they were trying to get just that little bit of edge, that little bit of extra goodness in their sound. They got access to the curve bender. Right. Um, do you know what? Let, you know what? <laughs> Let's talk about outboard gear then. If we're going to go down that route... Okay. Unless there is anything else that you want to add to the drums thing. No, that's primarily it. I mean, the story of the drums was, and folks remember this too, drums were, were recorded to mono almost exclusively. Right. So two microphones, four microphones, eight microphones, it was still getting summed down to a single channel. That's all Ringo was ever afforded, and the most he was ever afforded. And there were only two instances where that was different. There were a handful of the recordings that were done for Let It Be, where uh, Glenn Johns, who is the engineer uh, for those sessions, would send the kick to one of the guitar channels, and then the rest of the drums were on another channel. Right. And then, as everyone knows, the famous drum solo as part of the big second side of uh, Abbey Road Right. Uh, for that solo, Ringo was afforded two whole channels. Whoa! Oops. 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 Yeah. Checkmate. <laughs> I spoiled him a bit. <laughs> All right. Because, of course, I mean, part, part of the story here is that not only EMI owned the studios, but they would actually build their own gear, they would build their yep. own outboard. And so yep. that line between sound engineering and actual engineering was very blurry because it was a, a quest to improve the capabilities that they would have the, at the time, right? Yeah, EMI was very lucky in the fact that it was, you know, it was a large corporation. They made their own audio tape. They had the Hayes Laboratories that developed the red consoles. They had you know, talented technical engineers that worked within the studio itself, Ken Townsend being the most well-known of those talented engineers. Any piece of gear that was not hand-wired by EMI, so like the red consoles or the TG consoles, right. anything that came in was torn apart by EMI's technical engineers to be sure that it met their spec for quality of components, for durability, and for ease of maintenance as it went forward. You know, they were bench tested, they were improved. And so, you know this gear because it would get an EMI designation. And the most coveted of that work that was done back in the day is the uh, RS-125 compressor, which was originally an Alltech, I believe a 453, but, you know, again, Beetle Geeks, don't quote me on the number. Got it. Um, but it was brought into EMI, it was torn down, made sure it met spec, it was improved upon put back together, 
and put to work. Why would they do this? Because they needed to depend on the gear. When you're right. running three studios for nine to 10 hours a day of recording, uh, five to six days a week, your gear's got to be built to last. I used to work, you know, back in the days when studios were expensive and yeah. downtime with an orchestra sitting there waiting for you to solve the problem. That ain't fun. <laughs> <laughs> no. oh. That does downtime, not feel good. You know, downtime in general isn't fun. I mean, th and this goes to those people that watch your channel that are working with clients now. You don't want to make your clients wait. You want to be ready to do your job because it gives them confidence and the freedom to just create. And again, that's a lesson of EMI. They, before a session started, it was the job of the balance engineer, knowing the artist that's coming in and working in conjunction with a producer to literally spec out the session. Here are the microphones we're going to use. We're going to be recording two guitar cabinets. They're going to, we want them placed here and here. We want the microphones placed here and here. We want this outboard gear in line. Yeah, we want these compressors. We want these limiters. All of that was specced before the session started, and it was all set up and ready to go when an artist would walk into the studio to do their work. Speaking of which, I was observing, okay, here for example, this one, you got... Eleanor Rigby's four track. We got violins here, track three, track four. You got, what is that, congas, backing vocals. I see this diagram, right? The diagrams in the book cover the breakout of the work on the four track tape in this era at critical junctions. So the backing track, overdubs that were done, tape reductions that might have been done. Right. That happened when they would run out of room on a four track and they'd have to move those four tracks to another machine and another tape and do a mix to right. open up space on the reel for additional work. And then what ended up being coming down to the mix stage. Right. So those that's what the diagrams represent in the book. How did you get access to those again? Well, some of it, uh, there was a book that George Martin did called Playback. It was a very limited uh, run book, but in it, he had some notes of his uh, track use for, in particular, the Help album. Like the Help album is highly accurate for that. Right. But some of this is extrapolated by, again, the research showed that they used the red console, the four track console in a predictable way. In the very early days, the backing track was sent to channel one or a left channel. Right. And an additional work was sent to, you know, right channel. Right. So while those diagrams are not foolproof, they represent the work that was done, the distribution of work that was right. done. And they're based off of what the best understanding was of the practices of the recording engineers that were tracking right. the work. Then the final thing is through forensically breaking down these things and listening, you know, listening to the work that was done, the way that it was mixed for stereo was very LCR. Right. And so it was only post pepper that they started using a set of channels on the red console that allowed them to pan things everywhere. Right. But because of that, that also can gives you clues as to the combinations of things that were recorded at any one time. Right. When they were doing overdubs. To put these books together, there were these pieces of evidence that were floating out there, but no one had done the work to bring it together to tell the story of the song. That's my sole purpose. Like for someone who's looking for like Beatles gossip or that, don't buy my books. Right, right, there's right. There's no right, Beatles. Right. There's no, no Beatles no, 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 gossip. No. This is this is precise thing. This is basically geek land for whoever wants to really get you know serious about production, man. I mean, this is like history. I mean, to me, knowing this stuff is equivalent to. I don't know, knowing harmony if you want to be a pianist, you know, it's it's not like you can skip if you're interested in recording and mixing. Seriously, you've got to know this because this is where a lot of that technology comes from. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to do like a bit of a of a Rosetta Stone, right? That, you know, the Beatles are out there and and yeah, they influence everybody. I wanted to expose the work that was done. I wanted to demystify the work that was done because the other story of it, you can see in the book that they played a lot of stuff together. They did a lot of work basically as a live band most of the time. Right. Their overdubs were rarely the sort of style that we handle overdubs now of an individual performance with an individual artist, you know, doing just this bit on just this part of just this song. 
they were always arranging the work that they did because they were working with those limitations of four track. So an overdub could consist of an electric piano and maracas and a guitar lick. And they would figure out how they were going to play that together to make the song come alive. The arrangement and orchestration and stuff that they had to do to do the work, that echoes through time. I mean, thinking ahead of what you want to do for a song with purpose and with intent and with commitment, that's the lesson of the Beatles. And just what is needed at just what point to make the music come alive. Those are the lessons of the Beatles. And they're the same lessons that, that I think you should be applying today to any work you're doing. That's very cool. And uh, you know what? For the last section of this, is this a podcast? This could be a podcast. (laughs) This might be a podcast. You know, because I've been thinking about, you know, making podcasts again. Let's get to the mixing bit of it. Okay, let's go piece of gear by piece of gear. Number one, the Fairchild. Uh, if if you if you speak to any mix engineer or in the community, Fairchild means the vocals of the Beatles, the sound of the Beatles. Now, how was it really used? Was it modified? Was it a, just any Fairchild? And on what was used? Like drums, bass, uh, vocals, bass? How would that work? So again, recall that this is an era where, to some degree. You're creating your mix as you're recording the music. To a degree today right? again. Uh, yeah, today to a great, also. yeah, to a great degree. And so the Fairchild was used on the vocal chain. So that was a primary use of it. It did find use on the drum bus. The bass was typically using one of the Alltech modified Alltech compressors, not the Fairchild. When it came to mix, most of the compression had been already set into place. So they baked it into the recording. It's baked into the recording. You know, certainly there were, again, and, and now you have to think of later era Beatles, 66 on, let's say, for sake of argument, revolver on. There would be more inclination in those years to bring that outboard back into play to do something different or special with, uh, with the music. Harrison loved to mess up horns with extreme amounts of limiting. There's an example on the Savoy Truffle on the White Album, presumably a really great clean horn recording that was just smashed and smashed to the degree that Harrison apologized to the horn players saying, you guys did a great job, but you have to understand it's not going to sound like this. So certainly those things were used in effect, but the effects that they did draw on more commonly were sweetening effects. So now we're talking about uh, echo chambers. Now we're talking about uh, EMT plate reverbs, which they had four of them, still have four of them. Uh, Ken Townsend developed uh, artificial double tracking, the development of which allowed for the creation of what became known as phasing and flanging. That was pretty much the effect locker that the Beatles used through their whole recording career. I mean, it's that simple. You know, if you want to recreate and limit yourself to the toolkit of the Beatles, so it's not limited, you would work with tape delay. So either slap back or repeat echo via tape. You would work with echo chamber. You would work with plate and you would work with artificial double tracking. Wow. And that's it. And you know what? The thing is, uh, you know, nowadays you don't have virtually any limitations. I mean, I, I, inside my iPhone, I got a more powerful studio than I ever had in the late 80s, beginning 90s. What, what's amazing is that I solemnly swear that limitation usually drives my creativity. I have to find ways around it because I cannot do exactly everything that comes across my mind so the limitation becomes the sort of moment where i can apply my unusual solution and therefore that sparks my sound so at this point we're talking about more than four tracks after this like 67 68 are we talking what eight tracks maybe well eight track only came into play in the middle of 68 part of the white album is eight track not all of the white album it's almost evenly split and even of that evenly split aspect of it there were a number of songs that were started on four track that they were then ported to eight track when the eight track unit became available what you what unit are we talking about here uh this is a 3m m23 eight track that unit was in place at emi before the white album started in 68 but it hadn't been modified yet it hadn't been modified for instance to be able to take what they called the frequency control rack 
that allowed them to do the very speed operations. So it hadn't met muster with you know people like Ken Townsend. It hadn't met spec for EMI. And so it had not been released into the studio yet. Uh, but during the recording of While My Guitar Gently Weeps, the Beatles had kind of had enough and they sent Ken Scott and a, an assistant engineer to go get one of the two <laughs> three M machines from Ken Townsend's office, you know, his work office, and bring it in and put it to work because they were tired of it. You know, there was there were eight track available at Trident Studios. Like the first eight track recording that the Beatles did was at Trident and it was it was Hey Jude. That was the first thing they ever recorded to eight track. God, you got so much knowledge. My head is exploding. How do you keep all of that information in your brain? Some, some of it clearly is not still in my brain. That's why I write the books, so I don't have to keep it all in my head. Uh, but some of, it, some of it's still there. It so then out. from 8-track, they would use the 1, 2, 3, 4, TG? Uh, yeah, TG, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And it's a 2J37. Yeah, now, now here, was a, here was an issue. We're going to record Let It Be now, and I don't want to record. I'm the Beatles, and I've started building Apple Studios, and I don't want to record that dingy hole in the wall you know, that we know as EMI. I want to record in my swanky Seville Row, you know, office, right? So they go there and they had a guy who went by the moncure of uh, Magic Alex, who supposedly had built them a multi-track studio and he hadn't. So they had to borrow gear from EMI to make the Let It Be recording at uh, Apple Studios. And yes, they used two desks. They used a Red 51 desk and a Red 37 desk that were tied to the 3M8 track at uh, Apple Studios to do that work. And what, what was the master recorder? It was, again, a 3M. 3M was the manufacturer, and the model was an M23. But then what would they mix to? Half inch, quarter inch? They mixed a quarter inch. Two quarter inch. Yeah. J, what, J37? The mixing machines for the duration of the Beatles tenure were an EMI-made machine called a BTR, British Tape Recorder. And they did a BTR2 as the mono version, and a BTR3 was a stereo version. And it was quarter inch? Quarter inch. 30, 15? I believe the two speeds were uh, 7.5 and, and 15. 30 IPS was not available on the Studers ever. I don't know off the top of my head if it was available on the 3M machine. I don't think so. I wasn't around in the 60s, but I remember that the, the modern Studers, you know, the 24 tracks, they were flying, man. Oh, yeah. In the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s until, you know, all that passed away, or generally passed away, 30 inches per second was like the way you ran. You know, 30 inches per second, 16 minutes a reel of Ampex 456 and... Expensive 456. Yeah, expensive, like 40 bucks a reel. <laughs> 40 bucks a reel for the quarter inch. I'm trying to think. I don't know what I paid for Dude, it. Dude, I, I tell you, I remember that buying... What would you, you pay for it for two inch? For, for two inch? Well, I'm talking back in the day. I'm talking 80s, 90s then. Okay, I have to think in liras because I remember something like the equivalent of two, three hundred pounds probably. So yeah, I don't recall in the US and you know, I cut my teeth in Seattle. I don't recall that the two inch stock was that prohibitive, but I do know now that the two inch stock is anywhere from two hundred and forty to three hundred and eighty dollars a reel, and again, you still don't get any more than sixteen minutes at thirty inches per second on a twenty five hundred foot Man, reel. For real, I mean, when I recorded my first album at Chick Corea's Mad Hatter Studio with John Paritucci and Dave Weckl, I remember I needed three tapes. It was like a like a significant bill, and that's why you commit to performances too. <laughs> I mean, imagine even just, you know, just punching in and out. Actually, tracking vocalists was the most boring thing ever because you only had this, right? Play and rec. When you press that, there was a little bit of, you know, fading in. Yeah, a little pre-roll. You know, pre-roll just, I mean, it must have been something like maybe 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds maximum. And I had become very good at that. As yeah. a result, I get to do all of the tracking, including the Italian soubrettes who could not really sing. So <laughs> I had learned how to go like syllable by syllable. Holy so um, those were the days. And uh, if that did not develop your timing, I don't know what would. 
you right. know i mean if you had to play the piano i got i got i mean i was a jazz head before being a pop producer and i remember how much i got my my butt kicked because i wasn't nailing the click and italian right. pop music is you know very aesthetical so it's got to be super precise everything is like even before quantization days you were expected to nail nail the click nail the rhythm there was no other way but knowing how to play and and that's an advantage that you know, we had, and it, it was a less soft world than this. At the time, you would work from 10 a.m. till 3 a.m. every day of the week, and you would just do it. Times change. Yeah, yeah. suck it up. If you want to do this work, up. suck it up. <laughs> Nobody said it was easy. <laughs> That's right. That's right. No one did. No one did. All right. So here is the book. So now you are at the fourth one of a five collection, yeah, the, correct? Yeah, the four, the fourth of five will be out for Christmas time. Great. So when can people buy this again? Oh, uh, they well, they can get it on Amazon pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, volume four again, which will cover 1968 primarily. Uh, the White Album and uh, Yellow Submarine release will be available probably end of November this year. That yeah. sounds great. Man, I cannot tell you what a pleasure this is. It's like Oh, pleasure for pleasure for me. It feels like, you know, you were teleported from that time and you gave me insights. <laughs> you know, it's like, what? This is great. Yeah, well, the lack of hair might speak to that that I have part, part of me has been teleported from that time. <laughs> I, I was I was a child in the 60s. Um I grew up, you know, I grew up with the Beatles. My first musical influence of any kind there's pictures of me at four years old with a tennis racket pretending i'm john playing guitar it's a lifelong thing and uh it continues to bring me joy you know and, yeah. and it introduced me to music and it introduced me to pop music and rock music which i continue to love i mean uh i'm just a sucker for pop music that'll probably never change have you by the way checked out willie's fab folk tribute band to the beatles yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Yep. He's good, isn't he? Oh yeah. There's some there are there are some tribute bands that are scary good. Yeah. Um pay a lot of attention to everything going on in the in the tracks. Once I was talking with Will and we we were actually recording my first Sunlight Square album with Will Lee and Steve Gadd. I was like sitting in uh, it was Power Station, but at the time it was called um you know, Power Station changed name at some point. Anyway, so and he was telling me, Claudio. We are so fixated with those albums that we actually copied the mistakes. So if we can find some mistakes, we will recreate that live. That's how anal we are. It's actually a really wonderful point. Uh, so sorry to extend you here. Again, in my preparation for, uh, actually preparation for a talk I'm doing next week at uh, Rochester University in New York uh, for an Abbey Road conference. Well, I've been breaking down the song Come Together. At the very end of that song, they're vamping on Come Together as it goes, as, as it leaves. McCartney is half the time he is playing under the note and he's not playing under the note because he's out of tune. He's pulling up to up to a d but he's pulling up to a d from a d flat is how he's getting the d so he lets it slip in and out and in and out the d flat pulled up to the d natural and it's why that stuff sounds so gritty and he does it a lot yeah he plays under the note a lot yeah it's those little things yeah, it's those little things that like, those are the keys of those sounds. It's like guys that are willing to like really push stuff around and see what happens with it. And for McCartney, he pl he plays a lot of bass on the Beatles tracks. Yeah, yeah. From the get-go, he played a lot of bass. Very yeah. busy player. And he had fun with it. Slippery, weird. Hey, Bulldog's another example where he plays under the note and pulls to the pitch. Really weird stuff, but so cool. Okay, so I'm going to ask you one last question, and yeah. I asked the same question to the public here. What are your top three Beatles songs? Oh, gracious. Um, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, a really straightforward rock and roller that for just a couple little twists and turns becomes a psychedelic masterpiece. I Am the Walrus, a crazy complex recording and inventive from start to end and then just for like a beautiful song probably something like i will sometimes you just want a beautiful song you sir are a connoisseur <laughs> that's <laughs> for sure listen my friend 
thanks for your time. Thanks for coming to the show. I'm really happy and I hope you're doing great there in Canada. No complaints from me. Yeah. And But, uh, um, hey, if you universal ever come, healthcare. <laughs> you know, if you ever come to central London, please show up. Oh, for sure, for sure. And and uh, as you know from our pre-show talk here, uh, you've got an open invitation uh, for Toronto. Myself and a number of people that you met prior would love to host you and, and uh, show off some keyboards uh, to you. <laughs> Listen, be careful what you wish for because in the background, I can see that the 2600, 2500, and that, and that JP8. Jupiter 8. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and we're just we're just <laughs> scratching the keyboard surface there. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much for coming to the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have any more uh, questions about the Beatles, you want to hit this chat. I don't know, Jerry, maybe you can try and answer some of them as well. For sure. I'm happy to do that. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. I hope you're staying inspired. I hope you're making great music. Dr. Mix.